Thank you. Um, let me know if you can't hear me. Thank you, Mark, for that introduction. I'll try to arrange that you get some merit pay for that. Uh, however, if there is not 100% applause when I'm done, we're taking it back. Uh, it's actually a pleasure to be here, uh, and I appreciate the invitation. Uh, I wish I was here today to announce that I had just completed a deal to buy Facebook, the Oprah Winfrey Show, and Paramount Pictures, since that's where education policy is apparently being made these days. And that I was turning them all into publicly accountable democratic institutions to improve education for all kids, and this was the first meeting of the steering committee. Unfortunately, that's not happening. Uh, I'm here today because I was asked to come and speak with you about who's bash bashing teachers in public schools and what we can do about it. And since I live in a state with a governor who's making himself a national reputation for doing just that, I guess it makes me something of an expert or at least a recent victim. And this is clearly a national phenomenon. The short answer to the question is that far too many people are bashing public schools and teachers and we need to give them some homework because very few of them know what they're talking about. And there are a few, and I won't mention any names, who need some serious <laughs> detention because they are doing an awful lot of damage to a very important public institution. But the longer answer is that this bashing is coming from different places for different reasons. And to respond effectively to the very real attacks that our schools and our profession and our communities are facing, it is important to pay attention to the differences. The parent who's angry at the public school system because they're not doing a good job of educating his or her children is not the same as the billionaire with no education experience who couldn't survive in your classroom for a day but has made privatizing education policy a hobby and can do it and has the resources to do it because the country's financial and tax systems are broken. The educators who start a community charter school because they want to create a collaborative, supportive school culture for kids are not the same as the hedge fund managers and their political allies who are investing in charter school franchises because they see an opportunity to turn a profit or to privatize one of the most important last public institutions we have. And the well-meaning college graduate who uh, joins Teach for a While out of an altruistic <laughs> impulse is not the same as the corporate managers who want to use market reforms to create a less expensive, less secure, less experienced teaching force. And even the hard-pressed taxpayer who directs his or her frustration at the teachers who are struggling to hang on to their health insurance or their pensions, which far too, many, too few people in our country have, are not the same as those responsible for the obscene inequality, which is squeezing both. You know, back home in New Jersey, uh, in the next town from where I live, there's a man named David Tepper. David Tepper uh, runs the Appaloosa, Appaloosa Hedge Fund. Last year, Mr. Tepper made $4 billion running the hedge fund. That's with a B. This was equal to 60% of the salaries of the teachers in the state of New Jersey who teach over 850,000 students. But my governor rolled back a millionaire's tax and cut $1 billion out of the state school budget so people like Mr. Tepper could have lower taxes. It is not possible to sustain a successful school system or even to have a, a, a functioning democracy for long under such policies. Now, I've spent a large part of my adult life complaining about public education, <laughs> criticizing the flawed institutions and policies of schools as an education activist, as a teacher, and as a policy advocate. But these days, I also find myself spending an awful lot of time defending that same system and the very idea of public education against those who say, sometimes quite literally, it should be blown up. Because the increasingly polarized education debate around education policy, the national polarized debate around education policy, is not just about whether teachers are going to feel the sting of public criticism or whether or not school budgets are going to experience another cut in a society that has a serious upside down problem with its priorities. It's really not even about the hot button issues like charter, uh, charter schools or merit pay. What's at stake ultimately is something much more basic. It's whether the right to a free public education for all children 
is going to survive as a democratic ideal in the society, and whether the schools and the districts needed to provide it are going to survive as public institutions, democratically run by citizens, however imperfectly, or whether they're going to be privatized and commercialized by the same corporate interests which increasingly dominate all aspects of our society. Now, part of this clash between public interest and uh, public policy and private interests involves the use of very emotionally charged images and rhetoric to frame issues in ways that serve particular agendas. And this is where Waiting for Superman has played a particularly bad role. Long before Davis Guggenheim, the uh, film's director, jumped out of a phone booth in his Superman costume, I spent three decades as a high school teacher in Patterson, New Jersey, one of my state's poorest cities. Patterson, some of you may remember, had its own 15 minutes of school reform fame with another superhero school movie called, Joe, uh, called Lean on Me, which was about the bullhorn and bat-toting principal Joe Clark and his tenure at Eastside High School, a sanitized movie that still irritates me every time I walk into a video store, and I'm glad video stores are disappearing for that reason. <laughs> When Clark made the cover of Time Magazine in 1988 as Ronald Reagan's favorite get tough principal, his baseball bat was aimed at the young black males who at the time were being demonized as a criminal element in the schoolyard. Today the targets have changed. When Michelle Ree, the former chancellor of the DC public school system was on the cover of Time Magazine about a year ago, her weapon was a broom to get rid of all the lousy teachers in their unions. For the past few months, this movie, Waiting for Superman, has been mobilizing celebrity star power and high-profile political support for an education reform movement that is now destabilizing even successful schools and districts and creating tremendous upheaval in struggling ones. In Newark, where I now work for the Education Law Center, we're seeing up close a particularly bizarre version of this campaign involving Oprah, Mark Zuckerberg, the billionaire founder of Facebook, and half the cast of Guggenheim's movie who come through regularly. The now familiar buzzwords of this campaign are charter schools, merit pay, and test-based accountability. But the larger goal, to borrow a phrase from the Democrats for Education Reform, a political lobby financed by hedge fund millionaires, which has been a central architect of this campaign, the larger goal is to burst the dam that has historically protected public education and its $600 billion annual expenditures from commercial exploitation and privatization. This is not some secret conspiracy. It's a very public, multi-sided political campaign funded by financial interests like hedge fund superstar Whitney Tilson and rich private foundations like Gates, Broad, and Walton. And it's important to keep the big picture in mind, even as we talk about the specifics like merit pay and charters, because, in a sense, these issues have become the dynamite charges to break the dam. What is really new and alarming, and what makes a film like Waiting for Superman so insidious, are the large strides that those who promote business model solutions to our educational uh, problems have made in attaching their agenda to the urgent need of poor communities who have been badly served by the current system. And this is precisely the connection that Waiting for Superman tries to make. What many teachers saw when they watched this film was not a documentary, but a political intervention into the polarized political debate that I'm prescribing today. They saw a film whose central message is that public school was a failure because of bad teachers and the unions that protect them. That's why when Rethinking Schools last September launched its Not Waiting for Superman campaign to talk back to the film and its message, it got 15,000 positive responses in two weeks. The educators and activists who responded were not just responding to the movie, but they were responding to more than a decade of destructive policies that the movie promotes, and that teachers know from direct experience are hurting their schools, their communities, and their kids. Now, I'm not going to talk that much about the film today, though I'll be happy to do so in the discussion period. But this is not just about a bad film. The narrative of public education as a systematic failure has been fed in recent years by federal and public policy, by shifting federal policies away from the government's historic role as a promoter of access and equity in public education by supporting things like school integration, funding for Title I high-poverty schools, 
special uh, supports for students with special needs away from those kinds of equity concerns to a much less equitable share of federal mandates around testing, around closing and reconstituting schools, firing school staff, and distributing federal education funds to winners at the expense of losers. Taken together, these policies embodied in No Child Left Behind and now the Race Over the Cliff have helped create an impression that public education is a failure. And this is steadily eroding the common ground that public education needs in order to survive. A good example of how federal education policy has gone off the rails came last February when the President and the Secretary of Education, Arne Duncan, held the firing of an entire staff of schools at Central Falls uh, High School in Rhode Island because it had low test scores. They said it was a courageous act that was right for kids, a model of accountability that the administration wants to repeat in thousands of schools over the next few years. Secretary Duncan has talked about closing the bottom 1% of the nation's portfolio like the CEO of a runaway national corporation. Neither the president nor his education secretary mentioned that the school was the only high school in the poorest city in the state, or that 65% of the students were English language learners, or that the parents, students, and alumni of the school loudly protested the plans to fire the teachers. They didn't explain that the wholesale firings were made possible by changes his administration proposed in the Title I regulations, or that the uh, superintendent of the state pushing the plan was part of the Broad Foundation's net growing national network of pro-privatization, anti-union school administrators. Instead, the president just mentioned the low percentage of students who failed the state math test. That was the sole justification for supporting the wholesale staff firings and is the kind of test-driven policy that the administration is proposing to impose on over 5,000 schools in the poorest neighborhoods in the country. That same week, the same week as Central Falls, in Wake County, North Carolina, where my grandchildren go to school, and where the school board was the target of a Tea Party-type takeover the fall, last fall, the school board voted five to four to end one of the country's most successful diversity plans. The plan uses free and reduced lunch numbers to limit the number of poor children in any school to 40% or less. The plan has led to some of the best progress in the country on closing achievement gaps. And despite strong local opposition from parents, community groups, and the NAACP, the new board uh, majority voted to end uh, the diversity plan and to restore the neighborhood assignment plan that will resegregate the district and create numerous schools with over 40% of poor kids. But unlike in Rhode Island, President Obama and Secretary Duncan had no comment on that decision. Even though it will condemn many more students to separate and unequal schooling and roll back decades of progress to desegregate Raleigh's public schools. Secretary Duncan repeatedly calls education the civil rights issue of the 21st century. He even called the release of Waiting for Superman a Rosa Parks moment. But the federal government has completely retreated from the educational equity agenda that emerged from the civil rights moment, movement that Rosa Parks helped launch. Instead, the Democrats have been playing tag team with the Republicans to build on the test and punish years of the Bush approach. Just how much this bipartisan consensus solidified came home to me when I picked up my local paper one day and I, heard, I saw Governor Christie, the most anti-public education governor our state has ever had, quoted as saying, this is an incredibly special moment in American history where you have Republicans in New Jersey agreeing with the Democratic president about how to get reform. Now, under NCLB, this Democratic Republican consensus was used to use test scores to move decisions about teaching and learning and education policy away from schools, away from districts, and away from classrooms to state and federal bureaucracies. Test score gaps were used to label thousands of schools as failures without providing the resources or strategies needed to eliminate the gaps. Over 25,000 schools, nearly 30% of the schools in the United States, did not make adequate yearly progress last year. And that number is going to jump dramatically as the test score benchmarks in No Child Left Behind escalate to 100% passage rates for all students in all states by 2014. But now, on top of this, a deepening corporate foundation and political alliance is using the same test-based accountability 
to drill much further down into the fabric of public education, to close schools, to transform the teaching profession, and to increase the authority of mayors and managers and decrease the authority of educators. What we're facing is a policy environment where bad ideas that were nurtured for years in conservative think tanks and private foundations have taken root in Congress, taken over the White House, colonized the federal education department, and are now allied with powerful national and state campaigns fueled with unprecedented amounts of public and private money. Unless we change the direction of these policies, the combined impact of these proposals will do for public schooling what market reform has done for housing, healthcare, and the economy produce fabulous profits for a few, and unequal access and outcomes for many. Now the corporate and foundation crowd has successfully captured the media label as education reformer. If you support charters, merit pay, and control of school policy by corporate managers, you're a reformer. If you support increased school funding, collective bargaining, and control of school policy by educators, you're a defender of the status quo. Now, this shouldn't be surprised in a media culture that allows Fox News to call itself fair and balanced. <laughs> but it does make intelligent debate about public education policy difficult. For example, this is particularly true when it comes to the issue of poverty. One of the important lessons I've learned in my teaching and my work with Rethinking School is that school power comes in many pieces. And these pieces, whether they're large or small, can be used in many ways to um, promote social justice not only on big issues like funding equity or federal and state policy, but also daily, inside our classrooms and the choices we make about teaching, about assessment, about curriculum practice, and also in the relations between our schools and the communities they serve, and in the ways our unions advocate for our families and our students, as well as for the interests of ourselves. But serving schools with high numbers of students in poverty is no excuse for bad teaching. It's no excuse for poor curriculum or high dropout rates or year after year of lousy school outcomes. We do need accountability systems that put pressure on schools to respond effectively to the communities they serve. And in my experience, parents are the key to creating that pressure. And teachers are the key to producing the changes needed to respond to it. And finding ways to promote a collaborative tension and partnership between those two groups is probably the hardest and most central piece of school improvement. But the idea that schools alone can make up for the inequality and poverty that exists all around them has increasingly become part of the no excuses drumbeat used to impose reforms that have no record of success as school improvement strategies, and in fact aren't educational strategies at all. They're political strategies designed to bring market reform to public education. In the past, we used to hear things like, the single most important school-based factor in student achievement was the quality of, teacher, of the teacher. Now even the school-based qualification is being left out. Instead, we're hearing absurd claims about how super teachers are able to eliminate the achievement gap in two or three years of scripted instruction supplied to them from above, um, and how the real problem in schools is not the country's shameful child poverty rate of 23%, or underfunded schools, it's bad teachers. Now, it's absolutely true that effective teachers and good schools can make a tremendous difference in the life chances of children. And it's equally true that struggling teachers who don't or won't improve, even if they've been given support and opportunities to do so, need to go manage hedge funds or do something that's less important. <laughs> but when it comes to student achievement, and especially the narrow kind of culturally slanted pseudo-achievement captured by standardized test scores, there's absolutely no evidence that the test scores you read about in the papers every day are the result of bad teaching. And there is overwhelming evidence that they closely reflect the inequalities of race, class, and opportunity that follow kids to school. Scholar Stephen Krashen had it exactly right when he said, if we spent as much time on protecting children from poverty as we're willing to spend on testing children and evaluating teachers, we'd make much more progress on this problem. Thanks. If you applaud every once in a while, give me a chance to get a drink. <laughs> Waiting for Superman makes a huge deal out of the success of Finland, which is usually at the top of the international test score comparisons. What the film really leaves out, and what a lot of the pundits leave out, is that all the teachers in Finland are unionized. They're very well paid. They have tenure. And they work in school systems that does almost no standardized testing. 
except for the periodic sampling for these international comparisons. <laughs> it's true. Uh, there was an interview with Diane Rabbit yesterday in which she said, the Finns do not have a word for accountability. How do they do school? <laughs> Everyone also benefits from a cradle-to-grave support system that includes universal daycare, preschool, and health care, all of which help children achieve better results in school. And Finland's child poverty rate is less than three, while ours is 23. So teachers count for a lot, but reality counts too. And reformers who discount facts like that 44% of your students here in Oregon, did I get it right? I always mispronounce this. I'm from New Jersey, right? 44% of your students in this wonderful state qualify for free or reduced lunch. And the people who ignore this fact are actually the ones making the excuses. They're the ones making excuses for not making poverty reduction a central part of school improvement efforts along with adequate and equitable school funding. Instead, at a time when corporate profits and economic inequality are at the highest levels in the history of the country, the Secretary of Education says that schools must get used to the new normal and do more with less. Andy Rotherham, another founding member of DEFER and a Time Magazine pundit, says politicians like my governor, Chris Christie, are on to something big, that the huge cost for public schools is no longer sustainable. The federal government has put more effort into linking individual teacher pay to test scores and pressing states to eliminate charter school caps than encouraging them to distribute more fairly the $600 billion they spend every year on K-12 education. A few months ago, the nonprofit that I work for, the Educational Law Center, produced a national school report card on the fairness and adequacy of individual state school systems. And folks, it's time you called in your state officials for a conference. Oregon was number, Oregon. 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 <laughs> and you know, if I'm gonna trash the state, I should get it right. <laughs> Oregon was 37 out of 50 in the state school funding report card for its overall per pupil funding level. It got a C for providing extra resources to schools in poverty. It got an F for effort in the measure of how much a state invests in education compared to its relative wealth. You can read the whole report at edlawcenter.org. Oregon tied for number 42 on its effort level. And you all know that those low effort grades are the most embarrassing. <laughs> but for Secretary Duncan and Bill Gates, cutting the education budget is not a problem, it's an opportunity. They are now going around the country proposing that schools save money by increasing class sizes, ending the practice of paying teachers for advanced degrees, closing and consolidating schools, and replacing live teachers with virtual computer programs. At the same time, they want to spend hundreds of millions of dollars to create more tests based on the new Common Core standards and use those tests to implement merit pay systems. Now, at this point, spending more money on standardized tests to track academic achievement gaps is like passing out thermometers in a malaria epidemic. <laughs> People need health care, they need hospitals, they need better doctors. They do not need better thermometers. These test-based evaluation plans, though, even beyond the uselessness for student achievement, have the potential to seriously damage the teaching profession. There is no research at all that shows that paying teachers to raise test scores improves student achievement, raises graduation rates, increases college participation, narrows academic gaps, or any of the positive school outcomes that the policymakers say they seek. The National Academy of Sciences found a 20 to 30 percent error rate in the value-added teacher ratings based on their own dubious premises. Teachers in the bottom group one year were in the top group the next year, and vice versa. The same teachers, measured by two different standardized tests, got completely inconsistent results. The basic assumption of these testing systems are at odds with the way real schools actually work. And bending school practices to accommodate them could negatively affect everything from the way students are assigned to individual classes, the willingness of teachers to work with high-needs populations, and the collaborative professional culture that good schools need to, to uh, succeed. These merit pay plans also we would require yet another massive increase in the amount of testing to deal with the fact that less than 25% of staffs in most systems teach the math and language arts subjects that most states now test. There's a researcher who works with uh, ELC named Bruce Baker at Rutgers. And he does great work. He does a wonky blog called School Finance 101, which is 
well worth your time. And he regularly takes on the claims of the value-added testers and shows how their plans to uh, design the best available method for teacher evaluation could lead to chaos, random teacher firings, and endless lawsuits. As Bruce put it, if the best available automobile burst into flames, one out of every fifth starts, I'd walk. <laughs> when you add these plans to the practice that's now underway in cities like Los Angeles and New York, to publish these, what I'm starting to call psychometric astrology readings in the paper, <laughs> next to the names and pictures of individuals, you have a recipe for community chaos and educational tragedy. These plans are not about helping schools develop better systems to evaluate support uh, teacher effectiveness. They are obstacles to it. For example, in Montgomery County, Maryland, the Montgomery County Education Association negotiated a professional growth system that included using test scores as one small part of a comprehensive teacher evaluation process that looked at student outcomes, classroom performance, professional responsibilities, advanced degrees, and other factors. The process requires all new teachers and all teachers who've been identified as struggling as, uh, to work with a well-trained teacher coach over a two-year period in order to approve their practice and results. The system has resulted in an increase system-wide in teacher quality and includes decisions jointly supported by the union and the district to remove several hundred teachers over the course of several years from the classroom. But this year, the state won a Race to the Top grant that, under federal pressure, requires 50% of all teacher evaluations to be based on test scores. The grant threatens to destroy a successful system developed by collective bargaining that actually works to improve results for teachers and students. The real impact of these merit pay plans will be to weaken that kind of school-based collaboration and move decision-making away from schools to external bureaucracies and managers. Last week in the New York Times, they described a plan now being funded in several cities by the Gates Foundation to combine test-based evaluation with the videotaping of classroom lessons. By next June, Gates researchers will have videotaped 24,000 lessons, have 64,000 hours of digitized classroom video. The plan is to have these videos evaluated by people who have never been to the school, have no relationship with the people, uh, the teachers in the school, and are using checklists that have been developed by external experts. It's like the grading for standardized tests that get sent off to commercial testing vendors to be graded by temporary employees. And of course, you know there's a contractor providing the equipment. Teachscape Company is providing cameras, software, and other services at an estimated first-year startup cost of about one and a half million dollars a district. Now, the fundamental flaw here is not the mindless tech think or even the gadget worship, bad as that is. It's the absolutely clueless disrespect for the central role that classroom teachers and school-based educators must play in any plan for school improvement. Compare this approach with a very different use of classroom video described by Sacramento teacher blogger Larry Forlazzo. Larry Forlazzo worked with an instructional consultant who had been in the school for several years to videotape his instruction and then to critique it. And then he decided to show it to his class and to talk about it with his students and with some of the other teachers in the school. And he said it was the most significant professional, experience, professional development experience he ever had in his career. And it was totally outside the official teacher evaluation process of the school. These are the kinds of evaluation systems we need, designed to support teachers in classrooms, promote collaboration with colleagues and school-based instructional leaders, and include parents and students in the conversation. What we don't need is more data systems that allow central office administrators or state monitors to run schools by remote control. The last issue I want to mention before I open it up to discussion is charter schools. As you know, if you've seen Waiting for Superman, charter schools are being hailed as a kind of new magic reform board. But charter schools have an interesting history that's usually not included in the current debate. The first charter schools were initiated by Albert Shanker and the United Federation of Teachers in New York City in the late 80s and the 90s. They were originally designed as teacher-run schools that would serve students who were struggling inside the regular system and be outside the reach of the central office bureaucracy and a very politicized school board. They drew on the uh, early rounds of small school experiments that educators and community activists produced as alternatives to the large comprehensive high schools. 
But after a few years, Shanker became concerned that the charters in the small schools were fragmenting the district, that they were creating unequal tiers of schools serving very different student populations with very unequal access. And he also was concerned that they were weakening the collective power of the teacher, uh, the teachers union, to raise district-wide issues with the union, uh, with the district. And so he pulled back at a time when there were still very few charters, and he and other union leaders focused instead on the standards movement, which for them became the engine of reform. But the charters continued to grow slowly, and the states, beginning with Minnesota, began to pass laws to promote the formation of charters, partly as a model of uh, innovation, but also to create a parallel system outside the reach of unions, and in some cases, outside the reach of federal and state mandates to serve all students. And this charter movement gradually began to attract the interests of political and financial interests who saw the public school system as a socialist monopoly just ripe for market reform. In the past 10 years, the character of the charter school movement has changed dramatically. From a community-based, educator-initiated local effort to spur alternative approaches for a small number of students, to nationally funded efforts by foundations, investors, and educational management companies to create a parallel, more privatized education system. Today, there are about 5,000 charters in the US, and they enroll about 4% of all students. The charter laws are different in each state, but in general, charter schools are private schools, I mean, are privately, uh, excuse me, charter schools are publicly funded, but privately run schools. Few of the charter schools justify the hype they receive in waiting for Superman. And those that do, like the schools that are featured in the film, are highly selective, privately subsidized schools that have very little relevance for the public system as a whole. It's a little bit like looking for models of public housing by studying luxury condo uh, developments. The most complete, you, you tell me to stop here? <laughs> the most complete um, study of charter school performance uh, by Stanford University, as many of you know, found that only about 17% of them produced even better test scores than comparable public schools, and more than, two -thirds, more than twice that number did, did more poorly. And this is um, without the uh, many having the heroic support of parents that you see in the film. In most states, charter schools do not face the same kind of public accountability and transparency requirements that public schools do, and this led to serious uh, problems of mismanagement, corruption, and profiteering. Charter school teachers, on average, are younger, less unionized, less likely to hold state certification, in a word, less expensive. Charter schools typically pay less and require longer hours. One in four charter school teachers leaves every year. A charter school teacher is 130% more likely to leave the profession completely. Partially, this attrition is attributed to dissatisfaction with very difficult working conditions. And yet, on average, charter school administrators earn more than their school district counterparts. Jeffrey Canada of the Harlem Children's Zone and Eva Moskowitz of the Harlem Success Academy, two schools that are featured in Guggenheim's film, each make almost $500,000 a year. Now, none of this is to deny the reform impulse that's a real part of the charter movement. Many times during my 30 years teaching in a dysfunctional urban high school, I wanted to start my own school. And many of the issues that public schools uh, critics like myself complain about charters, like creaming, tracking, and unequal resources, exist inside the public system as well. But public schools have federal and state and district obligations that can be brought to bear. There are school boards, public budgets, public policies and public officials that can be held accountable in ways that privatized charters don't allow. In post-Katrina New Orleans, where more than 60% of the students now attend charter schools in unequal tiers, there are now students and parents who cannot find any school, charter or parents, that will take them. In too many places, charters function more like deregulated enterprise zones than models of reform, providing subsidized spaces for a few at the expense of the many. In places like New York City and Newark, they are draining resources, staff, and energy for innovation away from district schools, often while creaming better prepared students and more committed parents. This is especially a problem where school systems urgently need renewal and resources, but are increasingly being left behind with the biggest challenges. <laughs> Nowhere have charges produced a template for effective districts, uh, uh, district-wide reform or equity. No one questions the desire of parents to find the best options they can for their kids. But at the level of state and federal education policy, charters are provide, providing a reform cover 
for dismantling the public school system and an investment opportunity for those who see education as a business opportunity rather than a fundamental democratic institution. It took well over 100 years to create a public school system that for all its flaws, flaws produces a, uh, provides a free education for all children as a legal right. It took campaigns against child labor laws, crusades for public taxation, struggles against fear and discrimination of immigrants, historic movements for civil rights against separate and unequal schooling, sustained drives for the rights of women, and in more recent decades, sustained drive for the rights and educational access of special education students, gay and lesbian students, bilingual students, and Native American students. These campaigns are all unfinished, and the gains they have made are all uneven, and they're fragile. But they have made public schools one of the last places where an increasingly divided and diverse population still comes together for a common civic purpose. In some respects, public education is the most successful democratic institution we have. And it has done far more to reduce inequality and provide opportunity than the country's financial, economic, political, and media institutions are doing today. But its Achilles heel continues to be acute racial and class inequality, which in fact is the Achilles heel of the whole society. Those who believe that business models and market reforms hold the key to solving educational problems have, as I said, made great strides in attaching their agenda to the urgent needs of communities who've been poorly served by the current system. But their agenda does not represent the real interests or concerns or desires of these communities. It does not include all children and all families. It does not include adequate, equitable, and sustainable funding. It does not include transparent public accountability. It does not include the supports and reforms that educators need to do their jobs well. And it doesn't address the legacy or the current realities of race and class inequality that surround our schools every day. Where we go from here, as advocates and activists for social justice, depends in part on our, in, on our ability to reinvent and articulate this missing equity agenda, and to build a reform movement that can provide effective, credible, democratic alternatives to the strategies that are being imposed upon us from above. Because in the final analysis, what we need to reclaim is not just our schools, but our political process, our policy-making machinery, our economic and social future. In short, we don't only need to fix our schools, we need to fix our democracy. You've been listening to educator, writer, and editor for Rethinking Schools magazine, Stan Karp. The title of the presentation is Not Waiting for Superman, Who's Bashing Teachers and Public Schools and What We Can Do About It. In a moment, we'll return to the question and answer session from this presentation. Stan Karp taught English and journalism in Patterson, New Jersey for 30 years. He has written widely on school reform for Education Week, Education Leadership, and other publications, and he is co-editor of several books, including Rethinking Our Classrooms, Teaching for Equity and Justice, and Rethinking School Reform, Views from the Classroom. Stan Karp coordinates the Not Waiting for Superman website for Rethinking Schools. He is director of the Secondary Reform Project for New Jersey's Education Law Center. For more information about Stan Karp and his work, please visit the Not Waiting for Superman website at www.notwaitingforsuperman.org. And now we return to the question and answer session from the presentation. Stan Karp spoke at Jefferson High School in Portland, Oregon on December 10, 2010. The first member of the audience with a question asked about other individuals or organizations that are advocating the teacher voice in these discussions and debates of education reform. What groups and individuals are providing leadership in this struggle? A great question. I'm sure I can't answer. I can't do justice to all, uh, but there are. There is an amazing level of pushback. Uh, one of the only good things that this stupid film did was it pissed <laughs> off a lot of teachers. <laughs> and there is a tremendous pushback. So I'm going to mention a few groups, and then I'm going to mention a few places where you might be able to go find them. Obviously, rethinking schools. And one of the things that's really you know, inspiring to someone to come into Portland 
is it has never been more important for teachers to have independent voices that are not strictly identified with the union. Because the, the particular battles that the union is involved in right now are extremely difficult and they represent only one part of what the fight is around public education, an extremely important part. Um, you know, I was someone who was late to understanding that teacher unions are our organizations and we are responsible for what they do and we need to take that responsibility and own it. But it is extremely important that classroom teachers and, and groups like Rethinking Schools, which there now are not exactly a Rethinking Schools, but there's Teachers for Social Justice in San Francisco. There's Teachers for Social Justice in Chicago, there, where, where a union reform leadership has taken over the union in Duncan's hometown, led by Karen Lewis, who I understand will be here next year for the Northwest uh, Social Justice Conference. There's uh, uh, the New York uh, Committee of Radical Educators in, um, in New York. There's also a group uh, that you find, Anthony Cody, uh, who writes a column for Teacher Magazine called Living in Dialogue, started a project about a year ago last summer called Teacher Letters to Obama, in which he gathered letters from classroom teachers, over a thousand letters, and then was able to arrange a webinar discussion with the Secretary of Education who was so dense and so disrespectful and so clueless about what educators actually are experiencing in the classroom that it has now led to a greater mobilization. And if you take a look um, at the um, Living in Dialogue teacher, uh, teacher Letters to Obama, which is on Facebook, um, there's also a plan next July to have a mass mobilization of teachers, a march in Washington. And usually when that happens, there will be parallel events on the West Coast. That's something else you can connect to um, from teacher letters to Obama. One of the things that they've done is there's a group in California called Accomplished Teachers. Um, they're National Board Certified Teachers who have very impressive professional credentials and who in the past have kind of focused just on professional classroom issues and now are getting into policy issues with people like David Cohen. Check out the Interact um, website. Um, the parents in Seattle, uh, uh, I think it's called uh, Parents in Action, uh, Seattle 2010, and New York City parents, uh, Leonie Heimson, do great work. Uh, they were the ones who were behind all the pushback when uh, the mayor of New York City appointed someone who had absolutely no education experience, who sent her kids to private school, who herself went to Catholic school. Um, and there were some great actions about that, which are the kind of things you can do, where a group of veteran teachers, um, after Kathy Black was appointed and got a waiver, she had to get a waiver by law to run the New York City school system, they went to a her stockholders meeting and applied for her job. <laughs> they said, we have no publication experience, but we have a book, we're gonna get up to speed. There have to be ways in which, there have to be ways in which teacher voices push their way into the conversation. And finally, I'll say on notwaitingforsuperman.org, you will find, if you go to the, um, there is a, a whole bunch of material there, but you also find over 100, maybe 150 articles since September that ha is, is a whole catalog of activism, research, and response to the issues in this film. And that will lead to links to. The next member of the audience provided a warning about another website that could be confused with the speaker's website, notwaitingforsuperman.org. This other website comes up in a search for Not Waiting for Superman. The other website has a similar name. This member of the audience said she tried to post a comment, but found that this other website required her to sign their petition in order to post a comment. She cautioned the audience to be sure that they've reached the right website before signing on to anything. Two things about this. Uh, the DEFER group, the Democrats for Education Reform, they have a campaign called Done Waiting, uh, which they want to turn into Done with Public Education. But also, um, um, Guggenheim posts regularly on uh, Huffington Post. And he had the uh, audacity about a month ago to post an invitation to teachers to tell him what he thought about the movie. And he got over 100 of the greatest comments that would warm your heart um, in response. And he posted just two days ago the lamest response in which he picked two comments to respond to. But Anthony Cody has a couple of columns in which he, he draws from those comments. Most of these sites are moderated. 
And so they're going to you know, limit your ability to respond. But if you get in there quick, you can get it on. The next member of the audience mentioned that Not Waiting for Superman also has a Facebook group, which posts announcements, which was how she learned of this evening's lecture. Not Waiting for Superman, in addition to the notwaitingforsuperman.org site on the web, there's a Facebook page of the same title, Not Waiting for Superman. Um, there are about, I think it's up to about 7,300 people who have, you know, liked, is that what you do on Facebook? Um, and, uh, and, but, but the thing is, between that and other projects, like I was talking to Bill about the Zen Education Project, which has about 5,000 people, and this becomes a building network in a social media land where you can get out the word, like getting people to events, and also uh, Teachers Letters Through Obama is also on uh, Facebook. <laughs> the question is, what has happened to the president? Um, I'll give my answer and then you can give yours. But, uh, um, you know, it was extremely, you know, not, not surprising in some, in, in some instances, but this was, uh, I think, the first time um, people were desperate to have change at the end of the Bush era. And one of the problems we have now is that a lot of us who don't have much faith in the Democratic Party went out and worked and won two national elections. And what we got is nothing. Not nothing, perhaps, but certainly not the change that we were supporting for. And that's a very demoralizing kind of thing to, to experience. And it's one of the reasons why we're cranking up again, because we had great expectations. And one of the things that happened, and you know, actually the whole history of how Obama's education policy evolved through the stimulus funds and the choice of Duncan uh, was the subject of an earlier article I tried to do for Rethinking Schools last spring, which is called School Reform We Can't Believe It. And if you go look at that, it goes back to the choice of Arne Duncan instead of Linda Darling Hammond, who was actually targeted and savaged and purged from the administration, who had been the, the chair of his education team during the campaign, the voice of someone with a long history in education reform. And she was targeted by the very people who were in, uh, who are um, lionized in Guggenheim's film by the Michelle Rees, by the Joel Kleins, by the John Schnorr, the guy who invented the race to the top, who is now in Newark uh, trying to do equal damage. And so I think what you had is policy decisions between progressive choices and non-progressive choices. And it wasn't only education. We had the same thing with Summers and Geithner in economics. We had Gates in defense. We had lots of choices where this pop. And you know, so what we're learning is a lesson that we already knew that we only get as much change as we're able to organize and force. And so we need to crank up because we can't depend on them to bring the change we need. We need to force them to bring the changes we have to have. Yeah. The next member of the audience asked about the politics of the incoming Congress. Does the speaker think that No Child Left Behind will be reauthorized or replaced by something else? What does this speaker think people can do to influence these policies? Is there any hope in Washington, D.C.? I'm going to leave that, do I think there's hope in Washington question, alone. <laughs> but in terms of uh, No Child Left Behind, I think there are two or three places to go to really look at the nuts and bolts of what the policy options might be. One is the Forum for Education and Democracy, and the other is Fair Test and the Forum for Educational Accountability, which really get into the nuts and bolts of policy suggestions on, how, on what the room might be to get incremental changes for a bad law that needs to be totally repealed. They're going to have to do something about this law because uh, if they don't, it is going to ratchet up the number of schools who are going to be in restructuring well beyond any ability to deal with it. The problem is that they're probably going to respond to this with regulations that target the poorest, most vulnerable schools in urban areas and rural areas, and that is not going to help the problem at all. Um, there are some you know, things I wouldn't invest hope in, but for example, this guy Klein, who is going to be the new um, chair in the House, has always talked about how he would be in favor of fully funding IDEA. 
uh, the federal uh, special education law, which was supposed to fund 40% of special education costs across the country after they mandated them, and yet has never uh, funded more than about 18 or 19%. Um, the three thing things that the federal government should do is get out of the testing and reform business completely, right? Um, have states use federal, leverage federal funds to improve state funding systems and have universal pre-K for all. Yeah. These, would be, these would be appropriate federal policies and maybe we can fight for those. You've been listening to educator, writer, and editor for Rethinking Schools magazine, Stan Karp. The title of the presentation is Not Waiting for Superman, Who's Bashing Teachers and Public Schools, and What We Can Do About It. To find out more about Stan Karp and his work, please visit the Not Waiting for Superman website at www.notwaitingforsuperman.org. To find out more about Rethinking Schools, please visit their website at rethinkingschools.org. This program was produced by PDX Justice Media Productions of Portland, Oregon. To find out more about our work and to access our growing library of free on-demand streaming video and audio programs, please visit our website at pdxjustice.org. And write to us with your comments and questions at pdxjustice at riseup.net. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks for tuning in, and thanks for supporting listener-sponsored radio, public access cable television, net neutrality, independent bookstores, and all forms of grassroots, democratic, community media.